Welcome to the first Nukipedia Pitcast for February 2023. This episode we have Fallout History covering the fall of Taggarty and the Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel, and an interview with Puerto on Empire Wastes, a mod that goes to New York in Fallout 4. But first, we have a special wiki announcement. We have announcements for the Nukipedian of the Year Awards. We have a number of big winners this year. We're going to start with the Social User of the Year Award. Traditionally, these have been called the Silver Bubbleheads. This year, we've decided to break down the Social Award into further categories. Firstly, for Discussions User of the Year. This bubblehead goes to a user that has been prophetic on Discussions, and has received a specific shout-out for the interactive stories that have been posted through the year. Congratulations to S. Shroud! Next, our Silver Bubblehead for Cross Media. This user has been noted specifically for helping to keep the Discord a lively place, but has also been a permanent positive fixture on Discord. It's Person Man Dude, aka Sigma Dale. And for our third silver bobblehead, this award highlights a user that has stepped up through a trying time on the wiki and has shown the ability to take on a leadership role. It's Saviour DJ, aka Core. Our next award is a new one for the year. The Vault Tech Together Everybody Achieves More TEAM Award. This group formed in response to information we'd received that cuts to our page sizes in the previous administration had not only reduced what information our visitors could find, but were also hurting the ability for people to find this through search engines. This team known as the Wikians Against Nukipedia Knowledge Error Removals or Project Wanker is the winner of the TEAM Award. Congratulations guys. And last, but definitely not least, the fabled Golden Bobblehead. This goes to the Editor of the Year. This year, we've awarded it to a long-time editor who returned under a new name. They've not only been involved in huge rewrites of our articles, but they've helped provide support to other editors, and has even lent his voice to the podcast to share some of the biggest moments in Fallout history. The Golden Bobblehead goes to our award winner, Layman's Reign! Thanks very much for joining us for the Nukipedia of the Year Awards. You can catch Layman's Reign now in Fallout History. In Appalachia, 2102, depopulated and overrun by the Scorched, a lone wanderer records the following. Overseer's Log, Allegheny. A mental asylum as a last stand against the Scorched. Brave, crazy, and crazy brave, the Army way. At least I'm pretty sure the Brotherhood had former U.S. Army members. Judging by the security systems, if only they had survived. What I wouldn't give to have a few of America's finest watching my back right now. As it is, I'll have to find out how they were planning to combat the Scorched on my own. Once I can figure out a way through these doors. The falling of the Brotherhood was one of the key events that spelt the end for post-war Appalachia. But how, with all the technology and manpower at their disposal, did the Brotherhood fail? I'm Layman's Rain, and this is Fallout History. Before we can answer that question, we need to understand what the Scorched Threat truly is. At its basic level, Scorched people and animals are infected with a disease, aptly known as the Scorched Plague. The original source of this disease is the Scorched Beast, a mutated creature originating from bats that live in the vast caverns underneath Appalachia. As for the plague, as Claire Hudson of the Responders would explain, What we do know is that the living creatures that come into contact with the Scorched Beast sometimes begin to mutate. The victim's skin turns dark, almost black, with the smell of ash. Some kind of biochemical process takes hold at this point. Lesions that burn with intense heat begin to form on the victim's body. The affected creature appears to be covered in smoldering embers. In the case of humans, higher mental function eventually disappears, replaced by extreme, almost animalistic aggression. We call the creatures that are transformed in this way, scorched. Needless to say, watching a friend or loved one go through this process is both horrifying and heartbreaking. Worse, there's almost nothing we can do about it. It was clear to the Brotherhood, and eventually all other groups in Appalachia, that the Scorch Beast threat did rise to the level of a new apocalypse. As Paladin Taggarty would note, We learned much since we lost contact with Elder Maxon. Grant says it's pretty much worst case. Threat level assessment, 
Actual Sierra Bravos are reinforced mobile and cunning predators. Bravos use echolocation to call in ground reinforcements. The breeding cycle for Bravos is off the charts. The saving grace in all this in Sierra Bravos only nest in specific places. We found free nests in old mining tunnels below the bog. But there's a main nest somewhere that's a real problem. In order to stop the Bravos from running outside Appalachia and possibly becoming an extinction event, we have to destroy their main nests. This led to the development of what the Brotherhood hoped would be the solution to the Scorch Beast problem. Elder Maxon had banned the use of nuclear weapons, but the menace had to be dealt with. Every time we think we have the Bravos, like they come back in greater numbers. Only Grant and Wilson know about Takano's final assessment. If word got out, we can't guarantee there won't be a panic. Every day that goes by, we're chewing through ammo, power, and sometimes nights. We desperately need to make it to the end zone or Appalachia's toast, or far worse. One way or another, if touchdown fails, the nuclear option may be our only option. Maxon's orders be damned. Operation Touchdown would be a desperate search for the end zone, the ultimate origin of the Scorch Beasts. Using a sonic detection network, the echolocation of the Bravos could be heard. And using this, their nesting sites detected, Palin and Taggarty would lead a squad into the very nesting areas of the beasts, and using conventional explosives, attempt to destroy or contain the threat. Get it online now, Knight! It's online, Paladin. Take this! Suppressing fire! Place the charges. It's now or never. EL-7 is the end zone. Bravo Central. Taggarty! Look over here. The equipment? Is this place a lab? What the hell were they doing here? The mission first break. The charges. Another tunnel! This way! Ah! Incoming! Incoming! If we fail, brothers, target these coords. Find whoever made these... things and- At Victorium! What followed was a massive earthquake. That earthquake would be as close as the Brotherhood at Fort Defiance would get as confirmation of Taggarty's fate. That lab, however, is another story for another time. But the skies began to clear. Knight Wilson took command of the Brotherhood of Steel, and Appalachia dared to breathe a sigh of relief. However, those who dared to think victory had come were daring to dream too soon. No later than June, the Scorch Beasts were again in the air. In its reduced state, the Brotherhood stood no chance to defend themselves, much less put in place a desperate rush to launch a nuclear weapon on the beasts. And by the 18th of August... Defiance had fallen. For anyone that reads this, know I tried my best. We all did. The Brotherhood of Steel held the line as long as we possibly could, but the Scorch Beasts kept on coming. I'm running out of time. So please listen. If the Scorch Beasts are still a threat, you need to get to the top floor. The security doors are top of the line military security. Find a way past them. Do what we failed to do. Stop the Scorch Beasts. The Brotherhood's remains at Thunder Mountain Power Plant would fall the next day. Not long after, civilization in Appalachia, which had somehow managed to survive nuclear war, was nearly extinct. We can only wonder what world that the Vault 76 population would have emerged to if Pallet Integrity had instead violated her orders and instead used a nuclear weapon on Scorch Beast instead of a personal assault on January 29th, 2095. This month on the Mod Squad, we're talking to the team behind Empire Waste, a Fallout 4 mod set in the Big Apple. And I'm joined by Porter Wolf, who is the project lead on the Empire Waste project. How did you get into Fallout? Are you a new fan or are you an old fan or something in between? So I started off with Fallout 2 when I was really too young to be playing Fallout 2. I was able to buy it at a yard sale, which is really the only way I could have gotten it. And I enjoyed it, but I didn't really become a fan per se until like fallout 3 came out and uh, i was in like high school and college and could really appreciate it and then from there that's where i kind of just became obsessed <laughs> awesome was there anything in particular with fallout 2 that caught your eye i really like sci-fi in general i was always a big fan of star trek and things like that so seeing a video game that was a, a sci-fi computer game uh definitely was like oh i would enjoy this and i, I did enjoy it and i really liked the setting and it's, it's actually funny because when Fallout 3 came out, I forgot that I had ever played Fallout 2 um, until well after I actually ended up playing Fallout 3. Fallout 3, though, caught me with like just 
the visuals of it, like how every character is named and it's not just generic citizen everywhere and how every building's window is slightly differently broken. That was the beginning of my special obsession about the series. Great. So it's nice to see that that's got a bit of a mix in there. So why New York? Does the city have special meaning to you and the rest of the team? So the shallow answer is that simply I moved to the greater New York area for college. So I've become very familiar with the location. But beyond that, I really wanted to explore the culture of fallout in New York City with all the capitalism, consumerism on full display, along with a corrupt government and abject industrial military complex and just superimposed on such an Americana. I thought that that would be perfect. Well, it, it certainly is. So New York is not covered a lot in the law. The Fallout Bible does suggest something about a nuclear power plant going critical in 65. And there's a few small nods here and there in the other games. Does your law build on any of that existing law or does it mostly do its own thing? So what little was created involving New York, we kept canon for our story. So you will hear about the hot summer. You'll hear about the UN building no longer having the UN. But there was a great deal we had free reign on. But even with that, we tried to keep it compatible with established lore. Right. It's great there that you're making sure that you are covering those bases there. Now, I see in, in 2020, when most of us were having a bit of a drama in our own personal <laughs> lives, the team did have a bit of a reset. Can you tell us a bit more about that reset? And has that been the biggest challenge that the team has faced during the game? Yeah, indeed, the entire world map was scrapped. Uh, honestly, the biggest challenge was the motivation to continue after such a major setback. We were just shy of halfway done with the world space back then. But thankfully, we continued forward. And honestly, the mod's better for it. Sometimes we post comparative shots with our current version and the 2020 version. And as much as it sucked to start over, it definitely gave us the chance to do it even better. So I don't regret it. Awesome. Have there been any other big challenges that you can talk about? As far as challenges are concerned, the game is great to mod as far as having Bethesda's engine available to us. However, having a multiple person team has its own challenges. Trying to have different people editing the same file at the same time is impossible. So we have to have multiple files that we end up merging together. And that merging process is very tedious, <laughs> um, not impossible, but very tedious, which kind of keeps our team relatively small. We don't want to have 20 files that we have to merge together and make sure nothing broke. So that was our other major hurdle. Have you found any tools that are useful for managing that multiple access issue? So luckily we've been on good terms with other major Fallout mod teams, and they've really been a major assistance to that Fallout London, Fallout Miami, Fallout Cascadia, et cetera. They've taught us their ways of doing it, and we cherry picked the best ways of each team to best do it ourselves. Awesome. It's great that you are working together there. I've noticed that the Fallout creator community is a very supportive and inclusive one. What has been the most exciting part of the mod so far to work on that you can share? So honestly, the, the most exciting part has been the public's reaction. We've got to meet so many amazing people in the community and many of our team, like I mentioned, has worked on other major projects, which really energizes us with hype for the follow in general. So just honestly, that I think has been the best part of the whole experience. Awesome. Now, obviously with fan-made projects, there's never so much a completion date, but if I was to try and play through your main quest at the moment, how far would I get? So as far as the main quest, the main quest is actually kind of simple because the side quests really add on to it. So the, the main quest, you get all the way up until pretty much the climax of the main story. There's like a final thing afterwards that we haven't implemented yet. But the bulk of this mod is going to be really the supportive stories of all the little towns and settlements and people. So that much we still have to put together. Awesome. That focus really makes me sort of very excited for your project there because at the end of the day, a lot of what Fallout has done well is tell the story of these communities. So I'm glad to hear that you're doing that sort of thing. Thank you. Part of the purpose of this show is to try and share and bring to light the work that other creators do. Are there any other Fallout creators out there, be it mods or be it something else, that you don't think get enough attention that we can try and shine a bit of a light on? Yeah, there's a small modding team working on another project set in Oregon in an area called Goose Bay. The people working on it are brilliant. Also, there's a 3D modeler and animator that we have on our team 
His name is Just Reg, and he's released several standalone weapon and armor mods that are really cool. Our team's really excited to watch him continue to grow. And one of the people I'm most proud to have known through this whole thing was the person who started the Chad podcast, who has oh, worked. Yes, yeah, he's, he's an amazing person. I think all of the work that he's done in just the last couple of years with the community and with charity work and just everything has been really amazing. I think he deserves a lot of praise. He, he certainly does there. It, so it, for, for those who are very much interested in coming to the Big Apple, as you say, if, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. What are the <laughs> best ways to follow the project? Uh, currently, the best way to follow is Twitter. We're the most active there. But we do have all the main, you know, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera. So we do have a link tree if you want to see all of our social media, but all of those are just the same name. It's Empire Waste, and you can find us pretty much everywhere. Awesome. So before you go, I'd like to share with our listeners some of the sounds of the game. What is it we're about to listen to, and how does it fit into the music in the game? Yeah. We're very lucky to have worked with an amazing musician, Melakoya, who has created a few Fallout-inspired tracks for Ambiance. I'd love to share this one track. Its name is Blizzard which is a really haunting tune that plays in many of the parts of the city that are non-affiliated with the settlements. So it's really the sense of being alone in an empty city. I think it's pretty cool. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for joining us there again, um, Puerto. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs>